but also you know i think people it's because a friend of mine was on facebook making a comment about um 90s hackers based on like uh, you know stuff from the matrix you know dressing in leather trench coats and being all trendy and stuff but actually my experience with this there were a lot of fat loners in their parents basements <laughs> you know <laughs> when you see them get arrested and stuff like there was a guy called zyklon who was um and i don't think he was an anti-semite i just think he the name sounded cool um but uh he was uh, in a group called global hell which was the biggest hacking group in the world for a few years and uh, when he got arrested he was just like a 19 year old white spotty fat kid you know and it was just, yeah. and he's you know getting sent to federal prison um, sounds just like me <laughs> well i was certainly all three of those things i was a lonely fat white kid when i was yeah. a ladies hacker too and i stopped yeah. doing it when i got my first girlfriend <laughs> <laughs> <Fat? laughs> literally true story i was like i yeah. don't really want to do this anymore <laughs> But yeah. So I've also um, got my a long time coming. Did Jesus Exist series finally started, and and per our conversation, uh, I actually watched um, Reza Aslan uh, did before you, did I came you on. Did a talk that was like an hour long. We were standing on some stage. There was actually a pretty good summary of that book. Um, was that the one you watched? No, <clears throat> sorry, I went to get some fresh water. It doesn't really seem to be helping. Um, the, uh, the one I saw was an NPR, probably a fresh air um, right. interview. And the first like six or seven minutes is autobiographical, which I've heard before. I sort of skipped ahead to where he talks a bit more about the content of the book. Mm. Um, but yeah, I have um, several points on which I disagree with him. Uh, but you know, I don't, agree, I don't disagree with his idea of the historical Jesus or the way that he kind of presents the, the basics, the basic uh, you know, sort of premises about what his life would have been. Well, the really important thing about Zealot and his argument in it is that, um, and this, he doesn't put this forward very well in most interviews, except for that one hour thing where he's standing on that stage, whatever the hell that was. Um, mostly there's not enough new, time for nuance in those things. So he doesn't put across what I consider to be a really important point, which is that he acknowledges that there's really only three pieces of evidence supporting the existence of the historical Jesus. And beyond that, everything else is assumption in one way or another. And basically the point of his book is that he, he, it's an Occam's razor thing. He's, he's trying to come up with the uh, thesis that requires the least amount of assumptions. And so he's not saying it's definitely true. He's saying likely um, it might not be, but based on what we do know, this seems like the most logical and um, uh, the, the argument that would post m pass muster with Occam's razor the best. Um, so that, that is a very key thing. He's not actually saying it as a definite thing. He's not saying it, not putting it forward as a fact. He's putting it forward as the most likely theory. And, um, he and that's what historians admits. do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what Airman does as well. Airman would also say that what is the most probable, you know, explanation for this, which one is the most likely? Yeah. Versus, you know, which is the most um, exotic and, and least likely and requires a whole lot of assumptions. Yeah. It's kind of the same premise. Historians don't establish truth, they generate facts, and those facts are subject to change based on new information, right? So but dates can change. It's not even so, history, but, um, it's certainly not historiography because there just isn't enough concrete facts. You know, um, I think if I remember correctly, the three that he mentions in the book, are the fact that Jesus had brothers, um, that is written down somewhere, that there's a family and that one of them is Jesus and there was a brother called James and there's a couple others. That is something that was written down. Um, uh, his crucifixion was definitely written down and there was one, I don't know what it was, but there was one other fact as well. Um, and the, all, you, all you can infer about Jesus' life are based on those three things. And the crucifixion part is the most important part for his argument because he points out that they didn't, that was a punishment reserved for, um, for the treason, basically, for anti-Roman active activities. Um, and, you know, it was, they wouldn't punish someone for spreading a religion they didn't like with that particular punishment unless they were campaigning against the Roman Empire and, and having um, anti-Roman rhetoric, you know. Um, well, if you so want to get deep into this, because I, I think what, if I could, what, um, how Ehrman, or would, at least from based on what I've read of Ehrman, like his counter to that would be that um, if, you, if you read the Gospel of Mark, and I don't know if all of, I've read the Gospel of Mark, it's actually my favorite gospel, it's very elegantly written in some ways, um, but in the Gospel of Mark, it, it talks about uh, Jesus giving his apostles secret teachings. 
And he theorizes that when Judas went to the authorities, what he told them was not Jesus's location. They could have found that anyway. What he, what Judas told the, the Jewish authorities was that in secret, Jesus was calling himself the son of man. And that he claimed that he was the Messiah that everybody was waiting for in this apocalyptic time. And that was when it moved into treason. So that would be um, from like an airman point of view, like looking at the gospels, um, how that how that whole thing went down. Two two things about that. Firstly, um, Re- Reza Aslan throws out the whole Bible. He doesn't reference it at all. Yeah, well. <laughs> um, he says it's not a historical document. Trying to glean historical facts from that document is not a good idea. So he doesn't even try. He says if it's in the Bible, it was it was written. Prob- it was probably heavily edited after Jesus died. And all you can really he he does use it for one thing. He uses it as a major part of his theory that James was really the most important architect of the religion, not Jesus. Um, and it, I'm not going to get into that because it's a huge thing about the, uh, the uprising and the Roman clamp down on it and all that stuff. Um, but I would also add that um, there were a lot of other zealots, a lot of other Jewish people claiming to be the Messiah around the time of Jesus's life. I think as Aslan mentions, like maybe there were up to a hundred other ones and most of them were some of which are listed in the Bible that he's throwing out. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's, he's not throwing, he's obviously read it. He's just saying he's not using it as a good, you know, historical document. And I think that's for someone who's data led, that should be a good thing. You know, it's not a historical document. Um, <laughs> right. But his, his degree is in like comparative religions. He's not an historian. Uh, and that's, so that's true. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, there are training, you know, one of the things I'm going to, I talked about in the first video was the historical criteria. I'm going to go on and do some more in the next one. But, you know, I think that there is a valid criticism to be set when religious people say, look, the Bible is a special text and you can't criticize it because it comes from God. That's Mm -hmm. as equally invalid as a reason for not critically engaging in a text as saying, this is a religious book. And so we can just throw it out because these people had a religious agenda. The fact is that the authors, when they were writing, when the author of Mark was writing Mark and and Matthew and all of them, they didn't think they were writing a holy book. They were writing down accounts. So if they were writing down accounts, then I think that that's how we should look at them and not just say, oh, because some people later on collected them into a book and called them holy three centuries later. That somehow it invalidates the original information that's in there. They took bits out, kept bits in, edited the bits that were in. There were translation changes dozens of times. It wasn't just, that's the thing though, is it, it's a reductionist uh, description of what happened. They didn't just collect the texts and, and that's it. They put their own mark on it over time. And that's why, that doesn't happen with um, historical, you, know, you don't go back and like edit Herodotus or something like that. That's, you know, that's not how it's supposed to work. Right, but that's why historians, right, but that's why historians go back and try to find early fragments and they look for variations and they trace back the genealogy of manuscripts, which, you know, the Gospels were written originally in Greek, but they preserve some Aramaic texts in there over time. And Aaron has a whole book on uh, the Orthodox corruption of scripture, where he looks very specifically at the ways in which the Gospel writers, he would change a phrase to make it more compliant with later theology. For instance, there's a a passage, I I think it's in Luke, where Jesus gets lost at the temple. Mary and Joseph both think that he's with the other one. And they go back and he's like with the scribes who's showing how smart he is. And Mary says, um, where have you been your father and I have been looking for you. And you have some texts within some lineages of the manuscript where that was changed to jo- Joseph and I have been looking for you. Because the father obviously then questions the idea of Jesus's divinity. So I mean, these things happened on the Orthodox side and it also happened on people not on the orthodox side but to sort of throw out all of the manuscripts you know because See, I, of I mean, some allegations i, mean, I think it's, it's i think unwise. i've misstated that though because but he's doing basically the same thing you are with your series as is historical do this a real person obviously you're not taking as read everything in the bible because the bible says he was a real guy right so your central thesis contradicts the bible itself but you that, that doesn't mean you can't use bits of the bible to as part of your argument so that's what i'm saying right. about aslan is that he throws out the central premise of the bible being that this oh, right. this had these teachings he's saying actually probably he didn't have those teachings he probably had a whole different type of teachings and then that was posthumously changed by james into being this roman friendly peace and love love thy neighbor thing that probably jesus was not actually about so he's not throwing out the bible in the way that i may have put across he's just throwing out the central premise of the bible as being probably fallacious and invalid 
So he, he does, he does, it's like, not like he never references the Bible. He's just saying that, look, the three historical facts, as far as you can call them facts, because they were written by, uh, written by Roman historians, um, those are the things that are the most reliable and that they're much more reliable than anything in the Bible. So he's just, he's just putting a lot less emphasis on the Bible as a trustworthy source of information. It's not like he never, ever references it. He references it a ton. Uh, right. Well, yeah. one of the one of the qualities of um, that it g makes for a, a conclusion that's stronger is multiple attestations. And as I go through in the series, there are at least six or seven different documents that are all independent attestations of Jesus. Yeah. That really have a similar pre a presentation of his message and who he was. And the idea of a James theory would require that somehow James would have been able to infiltrate all of these independent sources. It just seems to me not as likely as the idea that no, no, it was before. Were... his stuff was before all that stuff was written. Most of it anyway. Uh, it was well, like Ignatius was writing in like 110. AD. When were the Gospels written? Um, after 66 AD, right, mostly? Right, but what about Paul's writing and Q and the Gospel of Thomas? Right, yeah. Well, the Gospel of Thomas. I mean, I don't want to come to the woods on this because like, I feel like this is a real Bible nerd conversation. We might be yeah, which I'm not. I read the Bible when I was a teenager, but, but I don't really yeah. care about it anymore. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fascinating to debate, and I think these are good conversations to have, and these are the conversations I wish we were having about this issue, rather, mm -hmm. you know, like really engaging in what the evidence is and the criterion in the historical sense, and also um, it really, uh, yeah, I guess I, I like the idea of this, you know, the Occam's razor, and that's what I'm trying to do in the series, is putting the onus on the theories, excuse me, <clears throat> the theory to account for what we observe, mm -hmm. and not attack the evidence, saying, okay, if there's a problem here, you have to demonstrate where the problem entered. Yeah. Um, you know, I, for instance, would love to hear, what was the original Jesus myth? condense it down to its fundamental points for me. What was it and how did it change over time and who changed it and why? Well, as, what Aslan yeah. says is that Jesus myth was basically interchangeable <laughs> with the other zealots. But they were all basically the same. The only real way Jesus differed is that his teachings kept going. Uh, his movement, like most of the zealots, when they were killed or died or died in battle or whatever, most of them died in, in violent conflict. But the ones that, um, the, all the other ones except Jesus, when they died, their group disbanded and went their separate ways. With Jesus, they didn't. They actually stayed as a group. And that, that is the interesting part. That's, that's why they're different. And um, Aslan says, basically, his, his theory is that it isn't because of how magnetic a personality Jesus was, that even after he died, his followers stuck, to, stuck with him. It was because James took over, and James was the one who was really the magnetic personality who kept the group together and was a natural leader and whatnot. But, but James also sent counter missionaries against Paul, which he describes in Galatians, saying that, you know, before James, some were sent from James, you know, everyone was eating like Gentiles, and then he came along, and Peter was swayed over to them, and even Barnabas went over to James' side, and all the Jews went back to observing the law. So James's version of his preaching of the, of the Jesus' message was, it seems from Paul's letters and that were contemporaneous, that James was a, what they called a Judaizer, that they thought that you had to be circumcised in order to attain the kingdom of God because you had to be under the, the law. So I don't see how that's compatible with the apocalyptic view that was, been, was first you know, found in Paul and then echoed in all of the writings after that. Well, basically, going by Eslan's theory that James would have considered Paul to basically be a lunatic. A dangerous lunatic um, who was basically espousing end time stuff, um, which Jesus did too, and all the zealots did. That was a big theme of, of that era. It was saying that um, that it's all about to end, and you know, and Jesus was saying he's going to come back, and the end times was going to happen, you know, within the lifetimes of his followers. Um, and so, yeah, I think James was not, um, for, if, if, if you take Aslan's theory that um, most of what is written in the Bible is actually from James, uh, all the love thy neighbor stuff, um, then you can basically infer from that that um, Jesus was not um, focused on that, and he was just like most of the other zealots, um, and, you know, with the Messiah complex, with the end times cultist stuff and um that yeah that he was basically a generic zealot um he ended in a way that quite a number of the zealots ended um for the same reason likely 
So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess I would have to see actual evidence of that influence and its impact. You know, I don't, I can't think of any of the writings that would reflect that, that I can think of, but I haven't, right. I haven't read the book or listened to the talk. So. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah he gives uh, what I would describe as a, a medium amount of citations and references and stuff. I mean, ha having said that I'm a big Chomsky fan and the amount of citations and references that guy puts out kind of puts everyone else to shame. So maybe I'm being a bit too hard on Aslan. Maybe his citation and reference amount is, is, a, is a high amount. I don't know. Yeah, I'm used to people who just, who, who's, whose um, citation sections are like a third of the book. But Chom it's actually, it's, it's absurd. Some of the amounts that uh, Chomsky gives, it's, it's ridiculous. He's thorough as hell though, so good on Oh, him. dude, yeah. No, nobody is, is as thorough as, as Chomsky. He's getting on now, obviously, but in his prime, he was uh, reading, according to him, 80 news sources a day. Whew. Yeah. And the reason he said for that, he, he talks about it in the documentary, uh, Manufacturing Consent, not the book, but the documentary about him that was made over the course of like 25 years or something. Um, yeah, the, in that he says he talks about how the mainstream press is totally corrupt in america and you can't trust them you've got to go to sources that are much much smaller where you can get actual news like uh, he mentioned specifically christian church newsletters as being an unbiased source of, of random information they'll actually report things that are going on around the world like um, they reported on east timor when nobody else was in america because it was you know against the narrative um because indonesia was a friend and stuff anyway he says, so he hates that stuff, but you still have to read that stuff. You still have to read the New York Times and you still have to read the, um, what do you call it? I can't remember half of the names of the American newspapers, but you know, you got to read the Post, the Washington Post and all of that stuff. Even if it's unreliable, you still have to know what you're dealing with. You have to know your enemy. And so he would read all that stuff. He would read all the mainstream ones. He would read all the little minor little things. Uh, this is just in the days of print. And so he basically would spend all of his time researching that when he wasn't doing, you know, um, work for his actual linguistics courses at MIT and stuff, which, I mean, he wouldn't have probably had to do a lot of uh, preparation for between classes because he revolutionized the field single-handedly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, he is definitely someone I immensely respect. And it's, what's amazing about him is that even as a grumpy old man, he's still, you know, pretty reasonable, mm -hmm. which is... I wish I was as... I wish I, I could be that way as a grumpy old yeah it's a, it's yeah. admirable okay. yeah most most men or people in general when they get to that age they turn into you know right wingers basically <laughs> you just want things to be like they were their whole life and they don't understand all this newfangled stuff yeah you know chomsky wrote a book about occupy he was so into it uh-huh hmm I wish I was that into anything. Do you see yourself <laughs> being a crazy liberal in your old age or a conservative stuffy, you know, I, things were better back in my day? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I hope, I hope, I, I'm, one of my, my goals is once I've retired and it doesn't count, I don't need it for my work anymore because I do have to make a living, but uh, I do want to get arrested for civil disobedience on a cause at some point in my life, so. That'd be cool, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll do that as a blue-haired yeah. old lady. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's disappointing because in my country, we've become really apathetic about that kind of political protest. We used to be known for it, like in the eighties and before then we were a, a, a marching country. We were doing constant protest marches and movements, uh, really popular. Um, but yeah, these days it just doesn't fly anymore. Everybody, nobody cares anymore. It's really sad to see what ha what's happened. I don't know if that's the case in the U S too, with people becoming apathetic to political discourse, but it's definitely happened here. People just don't care. The vote, the, the amount of voting has just plummeted, you know. That it's is depressing. To me. Yeah. It's like, yeah, oh, they're all the same. Just go away. Yeah. Yeah. It's, been, it's a crisis of democracy because yeah. a, dom a democracy does rely on an engaged electorate to oversee what its government's doing. Yeah. And what we have right now are, are people who are just entirely disengaged and, you know, they're low information voters and they see one thing on the Clinton foundation and then another thing on the Trump foundation and they go, Oh, it's the same thing. Yeah. So yeah, it's yeah, an exactly. excuse to, yeah, to turn out, but it's, you know, with when people tune out that governments get away with stuff they shouldn't get away with. Absolutely. And that's why the situation is how it is. It wasn't an accident. It was done on purpose, you know, yeah. by the American propaganda machine. That is the most effective propaganda machine in the history of the world. The Edward Bernays PR machine 
is is amazing and like you know just in an objective sense is impressive uh, an impressive achievement but it's fucking horrible at the same time because it's turned america into a yeah low information low information electorate who vote against their own interests routinely we just get all our news from like <laughs> we just get all our news from donald trump's twitter now <laughs> yeah. 140 characters max yeah no, I think that there's, you know, we're in a unique point in time where there is a lot of information out there. And I think people who might not have previously been engaged are getting engaged or at least paying attention to things because they, it affects them personally or through another YouTube content creator or some other blog, they found something, an issue that they care about. Um, and I, so I think social media is, is changing that relationship. But because, of course, everyone is spread out, it, you know, if, if there's um, a chemical plant that's dumping chemicals into your local water supply, all the residents will have a stake in that. There's a localism there that makes it easier to do those kinds of protests. Um, when you're spread out on social, you know, through, your contacts are through social media, one, you get exposed to more things, but two, it's much harder to, to organize in that kind of environment, a digital environment. Yeah, also because the news just comes so thick and fast. It's, it also it has a different kind of apathy effect. So there's so much of it, you know. It's like, oh God, another water crisis, you know. Another, you know, incident of toxic water supply. And that happens with all the, you know, another plant being closed in some place in America. It just gets overwhelming, you know, the amount of it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with it's, that completely. It's, it's tough as well because the that propaganda machine that I referred to earlier it does still exist in the internet era and is is part of the is waging a war on um, you know real information by funding all these right wing channels. You know, like Angry Bastards did that video where he he worked out who's funding a lot of the alt right channels, and they often trace back to the same right wing think tanks and to the GOP itself in some cases. You know, so they are, they're finding ways to, to pollute the discourse with misinformation by funding people like Christina Hoff Summers, Gad Sad, you know, who put out basically academic propaganda. Who, they're yeah, academics, they're but they're putting out anti-academic propaganda through the guise yeah. of being themselves academics. Although they're both considered yeah, basically that. a laughingstock by academia, especially CHS. Yeah. Uh, it reminds me of the, the t this TV documentary that was on in the UK, The Power of Nightmares. Yeah, oh, love it. Absolutely love it. Yeah, I love all that guy's yeah. stuff. Yeah, and uh, the, yeah, the kind of critical media analysis, it was, it was very, you know, it really showed me, it gave me a new way of like thinking about the media and the way that stories are constructed, not just a sort of like the bias, but try to be objective, but this mm -hmm. sort of old dearism, being yeah. overwhelmed by the negativity and, and helplessness because you can't fix all the problems at once. You know, Adam Curtis actually did a documentary called Oh Dear, which was a, specifically about that. Um, no, well, I should look it up. It was quite. It was a short one. He he does a series of. Um, I don't know if you know uh, who this guy is, but there's a, a guy in the in the UK called Charlie Brooker, who does a lot of political social Love commentary Charlie stuff. Love yeah, Charlie yeah. Brooker. Yeah, yeah. Adam Curtis. He commissioned Adam Curtis to do a series of short documentaries to be basically embedded in Charlie Brooker's work, uh, and the Odia one was was one of those. It was about Rupert Murdoch and about how he has basically pushed that Odia narrative. Mm. Oh yeah, mm. yeah. Uh, the Edward Bernays thing I was referencing earlier—that actually was my original um, contact with that. Even before I read Chomsky, was um, well before I read Manufacturing Consent, was about um, was from a documentary that Adam Curtis did called uh, oh God, what was that one called? The Century of the Self, which was all about um, how Edward Bernays used the theories of his uncle Sigmund Freud, combined that with um, modern theories and propaganda and created the public relations industry. And about how the, that has had knock-on effects throughout the Western world. Um, you can see that beginning with things like changing the name of the Department of War to the Department of Defense, you know, 1984-esque stuff, you know. Yeah. The power of language. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. And, and um, uh, yeah, it's really, he's, he's a fascinating guy. And he actually, um, two of his documentaries were part of the reference material, well, ah, since I haven't made it yet, but a part of the reference material for my uh, Islamic terrorism series that I'm slowly working on. And his doc, that documentary, Power of Nightmares, and also another one he did last year called Bitter Lake. 
which is in the same I have vein. a video. Yeah, I have a video that I've been meaning to make for a long time. I just haven't found the time. And the working title is, Yes, Facts Are Socially Constructed. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about the notions of ontology and epistemology in the social world and how science produces facts that impact us. It's, it's going to be similar to the talk I'm going to give um, in, uh, for Professor Mario Arde's seminar in, in the autumn about science, scientists as knowledge producers and then the knock-on effect that has on our perception of, of our realities. So, yeah. yeah. But that video really needs to get made because when people laugh at the idea that that social the facts are socially constructed, I'm like, you might as well laugh at the theory of evolution. It, yeah, yeah. It's, well, it's just, exactly because evolution was a concept that was around before the theory of evolution was codified. It was pe like people like had looked at apes and gone, "Hey, they look kind of like humans. Wonder if that's a thing." You know, much before um, the Origin of Species was written, people knew about that. They just hadn't codified it into a, a proper theory and so the idea that that um, darwin came along and discovered it for the first time is not accurate and it, it really goes to sh the, to describe the difference between a term and the theory around that term you know or a concept and the theory built around that concept and it's the same it's exactly the same with patriarchy that's why the the term patriarchy without theory on the end has a different meaning because it's it's a symptom of the thing that patriarchy theory is about, not the whole thing, just part of it. And it's the same with germ theory. You know, people knew sort of what germs were, but they didn't have a total understanding of it and it was incomplete. You know, and that's what scientific theories are. They come along and they take a pre existing, I guess, problem, you'd call it, or thing, and um, sort of work it out and structure it into a, into a nuanced argument that's, you know, complete, or mostly complete, at least, you know.